Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, this week, it is a pre-recorded session. So if you do have any questions, uh, if you're watching on Zoom, you can reply to the confirmation email you got. That'll go to my email box. And then uh, I'll, I'll respond to those when I get back from traveling. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave a comment under the video. Same thing. I'll get to those when I get back. And then on Facebook, you can just leave a comment underneath as well. And then I will get to those at the end of the session as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainer. Been in the training department the last uh, oh, nine years or so, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep at Snap-on. I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I worked in a dealership and over time just became the default Diag guy in the shop, I guess. So I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my van. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs. It's been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. <clears throat> so our topic today is TPMS operation and testing. So TPMS stands for Tire Pressure Monitoring Systems, and these are the systems on the vehicle that tell us when our tire pressure is getting low or too high or something of that nature. This allows us to stay safe on the road. Of course, we want to have proper tire pressure in those tires. So let's talk a little bit about history. How long have these been around and who's been using them and, and how far have we come? So it first started in 1986, the first production vehicle to have tire pressure monitoring system in it was a uh, Porsche 959. And that system used two sensors per wheel, uh, mounted 180 degrees apart in special holes in the valley of the wheel. And they looked like a stack of poker chips, so you know, circular and had looked like a stack. Uh, transmit at a 433 megahertz frequency, that'll come into play later. Uh, so let's just, let's just remember that 433 megahertz. Uh, you can get codes and data from the scan tool. Now it was used in the 928 models from 1990 to 1994 as well. So up until then, uh, that's pretty much all they used it for. Then in 97, we get the first domestic US vehicle with tire pressure monitoring, and that was a 1997 C5 Corvette. Uh, Schrader developed the valve for them, and that was the first original equipment TPMS sensor in the US uh, vehicle market. Now, vehicle market, vehicle manufacturers back then and still now really have no standard tire pressure monitoring system. It's all kind of their own proprietary, not really proprietary, but very specific to a brand uh, as to how they do it. Uh, now, it, you're either going to see a simple dash light or in higher end cars, you'd see each tire shown. Uh, nowadays, at least they've standardized the light, but everything else is kind of up to the manufacturer's discretion. Then around the turn of the century in the year 2000, a large US vehicle manufacturer had to recall vehicles because they were having rollover accidents, 279 accident deaths and attributed to 14.4 million tires out there. And then uh, the, the government decided they needed to get involved with that. So they came up with the TRED Act, which was signed November 1st of 2000. And that law intends to increase co consumer safety by mandating TPMS in all vehicles under 10,000 pounds. Now that's a key right there. Starting in 2004, it was assigned to the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And it need, the system needs to notify the driver when the tire is below 25% by a dashboard warning light within 20 minutes, either 25% lower or 25% high as well. And then the dash warning light was also standardized at that time. So according to the tire placard, is where we would have to set it up. And a solid light on the dash, a solid TPMS light, um, means the tire pressure detected under or over 25% of the OE door placard value. Flashing for 60 seconds, then a solid light tells us at least one sensor isn't communicating with vehicle. Could be a dead battery or a damaged sensor because these sensors do have batteries in them and they're not replaceable. So you need to replace the whole sensor if the battery dies. Uh, could be an incorrect relearn. And then additional tire pressure monitoring component failures, such as module, wheel initiator, ECU, scan tool problems, all sorts of things like that. So how's the system operate? It's fairly simple in its design. Um, there's four or, or more tire sensors, depends on how many tires we have on the vehicle. 
Uh, there'll be a tire sensor in each tire and they are radio frequency transmitters. So they'll transmit over a set frequency, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, transmits it to an antenna, which then transmits that data to the module. So it knows what the pressure are in each of the four tires or more tires on the vehicle uh, as they're rolling down the road. And if it gets below 25%, throws a cone. A few different types of sensors out there. We get the least common on the left-hand side here. That's the banded. That was early on. Ford liked to use those a lot. Um, the sensor was wrapped around the tire rim. So you see, we got this, uh, it's like maybe like a metal strap that goes around the inside of the tire. And then you got this actual sensor there and it would just ride around on the tire like that. It was discontinued by most Ford vehicles, 09 to 010. So anything after that's not gonna use that. Then we have the clamp-in type. So the clamp-in type is not as common. Uh, they are still out there. It's more, way more common than the band. Um, but it is a, uh, the sensor itself is kind of like one piece. So you got the sensor down here and it goes all the way up through the valve stem. And then it's held on by this long nut right here. So you see that black, uh, black is the gasket right there. So that's the rubber gasket that seals on the tire. And then you need to torque these down properly. There's some special tooling for that, special sockets. Uh, you got to torque it to the right torque spec. And then uh, that'll hold it in place. Now, the, the thing about this is, at least where I live, is uh, salt, salt belt places where they put salt on the road. Uh, the salt can get in there and it can corrode the, it's just a, like a white metal or aluminum. It's, it's nothing, nothing fancy and it gets in there and it causes corrosion and then you can't get them apart. I remember Subaru, the first couple of years they did TPMS, they used these clamp in style and we just, it was awful to deal with. You have to cut them off sometimes with a, like a tie grinder. You have to cut them, cut the nut in half in order to get it off. Uh, so not that easy to deal with when they do get contaminated. Otherwise, you know, I'm sure they were perfectly fine, but um, that, it, it was just a struggle as a technician uh, when they would get corroded and stuff. And then now we have the most common ones going to be the snap in ones. Essentially, it looks a lot like a regular, normal, non-TPMS valve stem. It just might be a little longer on the cap end. And then it's going to have this extra metal material down the bottom, which is used to screw in the sensor. So we got the sensor right here. Uh, it's just a, usually it's a torque screw or a torque, tamper-proof torque screw. And that has to be torqued properly as well. And it's not a big screw. It's just a teeny tiny little thing. And then the sensor uh, attaches to that. So you do need a special tool to snap it into the rim. I suppose you could probably use one for uh, a regular non-TPMS tire. Should probably work pretty well the same as well. Uh, and then you uh, have to have that set up. So starting in 07, that's when Schrader came out with the snap-in valve. So this is between 07 to current, really. Two-piece, low-cost, easy to install. So all you do is pull the rubber valve through, and then you can attach the, uh, the, little, the little bolt down there on the bottom or nut, as it were, depending on, on the tire type. Uh, a few different types here, as you can see, is seven different, looks like seven different uh, variations of that, but it's uh, 75 to 80% of the market uses the rubber snap in one snap. So uh, as you can see here, it's a special torque device for that, for the torques bit, and a special torquing device for the uh, Schrader valve that's inside of them as well. In 2000, by 2008, we had 100% coverage on U.S. cars and light trucks, so every U.S. car and light truck made in, in back then. It was 100% of the market had tire pressure monitoring on it. Sensor frequencies use both 315 or 433 megahertz. If you're in the U.S., by and large, you're going to see 315 megahertz used in the U.S. cars and light trucks. Some OEs offer 315 or 433, like a Ram 1500, but that's fewer and further between. So the majority of the U.S. can be 315. Um, and then there's a multitude of different sensors that are out there. Also notice this. Uh, on these older vehicles, sensor battery can fail within seven to 10 years. So we're talking 2012, maybe even like a 2015 at this point, if we're talking seven years, those are up to 2022. So uh, they can fail, the battery can fail. And like we said, it's not replaceable. So uh, you should need to replace the whole unit as, as a unit in order to do that. Then come 2009, the European Union decided to enact TPMS legislation as well. So it's over on the other side of the pond too. 
So they mandate OEs on all vehicles do this and is a direct measurement system at 433 mega. So see how we had the two different frequencies? They use 433 more over in Europe, 315 over here. Higher speed German vehicles use more clamp in metal valves. So if you're talking the, the more high performance vehicles, they're gonna use the clamp in metal valves, I guess just more for more safety, more security that we don't have valves uh, failing or whatever. They also have tighter dash light specs over there. So it needs to be 20% of a warm tire versus 25% of a cold tire that they use in the US. You can also program a second set of tire pressure monitor sensors for winter tires. So you can just swap them over and you don't have to worry about um, doing any electronics with that as well. I can swap the OE wheels in the spring. Now we mentioned direct measurement. So direct measurement is gonna be pretty much 94% of the vehicles you're gonna find in the States are gonna use this direct measurement where it's a tire pressure sensor and it's measuring the pressure inside the tire of the air in the tire, that's the direct measurement. Indirect is used, however, on some brands, some manufacturers use this. And what that does is instead of directly using the tire pressure monitor, we will use wheel speed. So it's gonna measure the wheel speed and the wheel will spin differently at a different speed if the tire pressure is too low and it'll spin at a different uh, speed if it's too high as well. So depending on what the, how much of an anomaly it is between uh, the, all the other tires versus this one tire. So if it's a lot slower, then it's gonna say, all right, well, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's obviously low because we got, we got a lot of friction. And then a couple of years later, 2009, VDO introduced a multi-application sensor. So they call it a ready sensor. And that is used on multiple vehicles. I'll say about six or seven part numbers for both 315 and 433 megahertz applications. And basically it took the OE software protocols and stacked them on a single sensor. So these are shipped blank. You can use your TPMS tool, any of the snap-on tools, TPMS3, TPMS4, TPMS5. Can perform the function of cloning the sensor. So you'll essentially copy the information off the existing sensor and then you paste it into the new one all wirelessly, uh, you know, using the tool there. So it is helpful, it, it's useful, for, especially for aftermarket shops if you're dealing with multiple brands and you don't have to buy, I don't have to buy a Honda sensor and a Ford sensor and a Chevy sensor, I can just buy a sensor brand like this VDO one. There's dozens of them out there now, uh, but VDO was the first one. So there's tons of different sensor brands out there uh, and, and it decreases the amount of parts that I need to carry. I could also stock a part, I could stock it as a part. So if I only have six different part numbers, I can have a little drawer full of the six different part numbers. And then I don't have to worry about the hundred different sensors that might be out there on the market. I only have to worry about six, right? So uh, very useful, very helpful, especially in the aftermarket where you see multiple brands, you don't have to buy direct from the OE for that. Also, the other fun thing as a technician is uh, there's no standard service relearn reset for TPMS. Every manufacturer kind of does their own thing. GM. Uh, has 33 different procedures across all their lines and it is a stationary function. So the vehicle doesn't need to move, it just sits in the bay and we use a special tool for it. Uh, BMW has 15 procedures and that's an automatic procedure. So you put it in a learn mode and you drive it and it learns automatically. Nissan has one procedure across the board. Really, I, I call it two procedures, but um, it's essentially the same thing. It's just we use it with a scanner or without a scanner. And then we can go in and reset it that way. Also, this quick reference guide over here, which you can find out on the internet, and it tells you whether or not the sensor's in the tire or on the wheel, when I need to recalibrate or relearn. So in this case, after tire rotation, most manufacturers recommend that. And then after tire and sensor replacement, of course, you need to do it then as well. Now, as far as breakdown of all the vehicles out there, about 35% of the vehicles out there are going to be a stationary reset. 38% of the vehicles out there will be an automatic reset where I drive it. And then 27% uh, are gonna be an OBD2 reset. So generally speaking, the OBD2 ones are gonna be uh, Asian vehicles because uh, over in Japan, that's just, I guess that's just how they do it. Is they do a, uh, you need a scanner and you punch in numbers or you do, do a relearn mode that way. Uh, so we're gonna see some examples here now. So different reset procedures that we can talk about. Now, if you own a snap-on scan tool, um, any of the last tools in the last probably five, six years, 
as long as you're current on your software, you'll have access to Quick Lookups function. So in Quick Lookups, we have available oil specs and resets, as well as tire and wheel service. Now the Windows-based tools, we have TSPs as well. But in this case, we're gonna look at tire and wheel service because that has all the options and all the information for our TPMS. So this is first example is off an 18 GMC Acadia. Uh, so it says when the, uh, let's see. So set the tire pressure on the wheels to specify pressure, set the parking brake, place the vehicle power mode and on run start. Make sure the tire pressure info display option is turned on. So the info displays in the driver information center can be turned on and off through the settings menu. Use the five-way control on the right side of the steering wheel to scroll to the tire pressure screen under the driver information center info page. Press and hold the SEL button located in the center of the five-way DIC control. The horn sounds twice to signal the driver is in relearn mode and entire learning active message displays on the screen. So you would know it because it's gonna beep and then it's gonna tell you that it's learning. So with the driver's side front tire. So we're gonna take a tire sensor activation tool. We're gonna to talk more about those in a little bit. I'm gonna put it near the sidewall, near the valve stem, then press the button to activate the sensor. Once it's activated the sensor, it transmits its ID to the module that's learning. And then a horn trip will confirm that the sensor ID has been matched to the tire and wheel position. Now it is key to do it in the order that they say, 99 times out of 100, it's gonna be starting on the driver's side front, then passenger side front and clockwise around the vehicle. Uh, after a horn trip is sounded, proceed to the next three sensors in the following order, right front, right rear and left rear. After the left rear sensor has been learned, the horn sounds two times indicate the sensor identification code has been matched to the driver's side rear and the TPMS sensor matching process is no longer active. So once we're done, we're done. Now, I got this question in the last class. So how, what happens when I get duplicate sensors? Or how do I get duplicate sensors in there? Like it says the left front and the right front are both the same sensor ID. How does that happen? Well, that can happen if um, you had programmed the same one twice. Theoretically, the car is not that smart. The car just knows what you're telling it. So if you tell the car, oh yeah, I'm on the left front and you hit it. And then you say, okay, I'm on the right front now. And then you hit it and you never left the left front. It's gonna think that sensor ID is programmed into whatever tires you tell it is. So the car is not that smart to know, oh, hey, this one already got put in before. It doesn't know enough. It just knows it's trusting you. It's trusting you as a technician to do what you're supposed to do and go on each tire once. Sometimes your finger slips or whatever. And if it happens, then you just got to restart, restart the relearn and relearn. Not a big deal, but it could happen. It, it, it's happened before. And like I said, I got a question on it in the last class as well. Same type of thing. So just make sure if that does happen, just go around and just uh, reset it again. So that was GM and that was the stationary one, right? So now we have a BMW and that is the automatic one. So using iDrive, so that's their driver information system on their car. Going to go to my vehicle, then vehicle status, then reset tire pressure monitor. I'm going to start the engine, but do not drive off. I'm going to reset the tire inflation pressure and then hit perform reset. And we're going to drive it. The wheels are displayed in gray and the following is displayed, resetting tire pressure monitor. After driving faster than 19 miles an hour for a short period, the set tire inflation pressures are accepted as reference values. So you want to make sure you have them inflated properly before you drive. The reset is completed automatically while driving. You may interrupt this trip at any time and when you continue the, re the reset resumes automatically. After a successfully completed reset, the wheels on the control display are shown in green and tire pressure monitor active. See label for recommended pressures is displayed. So you're gonna set them to the specified pressure, drive it down the road and it automatically learns it and says, okay, well, this is, uh, this is where the tires are. This is where the tires are supposed to be. So we're just gonna go from there. Next one's on a RAM. Now, sometimes you'll go into this tire, uh, tire specs and you won't find anything because the manufacturer doesn't provide it. In this case, it's a little bit different. So on this 2018 RAM 1500, we're gonna go into functional resets instead. Uh, now this is a security link session. So you do need to have a, a account with FCA Chrysler, AutoAuth, and uh, make sure all of your numbers and serial numbers, et cetera, are in the right places in your, between your Snap-on account and your, and your uh, auto, auto auto. We're gonna go in there and that is a tire pressure monitor system. We see it right there. So we can, can do program any of the tires, including the spare. So we're gonna choose left front tire sensor ID. 
And it says this function should be used to write the left front sensor ID into the ECU. It's gonna tell you what the current tire sensor ID is. So in this case, it's just some dummy numbers. Hit continue. Please make sure you have the eight character sensor ID available. The ID can be found on the tire sensor label. So on the tire sensor itself, as well as the box that it comes in should be available. You're gonna have it uh, where it says enter to the ID. You're gonna hit edit, and then you can type it in. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We hit okay. And then it says it wants to verify on you know, what's the first character's number one, number whatever it happens to be. We'll hit continue. And then tire sensor ID programming is successful. Done. Uh, and then we'll talk about the Nissan. So Nissan, as we said, we have two different ways of doing it. We can do it with an activation tool or without an activation tool. If we use it with an activation tool, we're going to hook up with our scan tool and we're going to go into the ID registration mode. If we don't have the special tool, we're going to go down here. We're also going to go into the scan tool, but we're going to set our tire pressures to whatever it tells us to set it to. Then when it's in learn mode that the computer sees, okay, well, I see 36 PSI on this tire. So that means it must be on the front left of the vehicle. Like we said, the computer only knows what you're telling it. So if I set the right rear to 36 PSI, it's going to think it's that one. So it's, it's only as smart as the person operating. We go to functional resets. We, have, we see we have options for registration with the tool, registration without the tool. And then as far as the tool concerned, the two current ones that Snap-on has now anyways, are the TPMS4 and the TPMS5. TPMS4 pretty much requires a scan tool because uh, it doesn't have an OBD2 port or anything like that. So anything you need a scan tool for, you need a scan tool. TPMS5 is pretty much, it's just a standalone TPMS tool. So it also has scanner, some scanner functions for the TPMS anyways on the tool. Uh, it also has a DLC cable for it. So it works either way. Big price difference between the two, but you get a ton of more features on the five. As far as activating though, see how it looks like it's got a little Wi-Fi signal right there and then it's got a little Wi-Fi signal right there. So if I was gonna use this as an activation tool, I just take this, put it next to the tire and then I hit the little button right here, it's gonna activate it. That's all it does. It's just like an electromagnet, it turns it on, it says, hey, transmit. It turns it on, it transmits, sends the ID to the car, the car learns it and we're good to go. On TPS5, you have to go in through a couple, couple more menus to get there, but uh, it works in pretty much the same way. You can see there's like a little antenna up on the corner right there. So either way, if you don't have a TPMS tool in the shop, it'd be a really good idea to have one because cars have had them for what, 15 years now. So not a bad, if you, if you aren't into doing tire pressure monitoring systems, um, the tools are out there for sure. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to, if you're not into it, get into it because you know, they're out there and it's, it's here to stay. So might as well do it. Um, so here it is without the tool. Registration process will only work with existing sensors without the tool. If I have a brand new sensor installed, I have to use that activation. Then it's gonna tell us to adjust the tire pressure accordingly. In this, place we, in this case, we got 34, 31, 29, and 26. Also a good idea if you're working with TPMS on a vehicle, have a nice accurate tire gauge. Uh, Generally, an analog gauge, probably not the best idea. Probably a digital gauge would be a good idea. So that way I can see at least, you know, am I at 34 or am I at 34.9, which might be 35, what is it? So having a nice accurate gauge also helps working on this. Thing. Uh, and then it says uh, TPMS light on the dash will start flashing. Once you hit continue, key on engine running, drive the vehicle five to 15 minutes until test completed screen is displayed. Vehicle must be driven for this to work. TPMS light will go out and then it'll be done. Now let's talk about a couple other scanner operations we, meet, we may need to use when we're working with TPMS. So we're back on the 2018 GMC and you'll also note there's a functional test in here for tire type and pressure selection. So if we go in there, we're gonna choose our tire type and then we can choose our pressure selection. If we just hit edit, it's gonna allow us to go in here and pretty much anything from 26 to 95 PSI, it'll allow us to choose There's a couple oddballs that aren't in there for some reason, the manufacturer doesn't let you do like 31 PSI. I don't know why, but that's limited by the manufacturers, what, what's what they want. So 26 to 95, pretty much give or take a couple. So you can just set it to whatever you need it to be, uh, judging by your tire, if you change your tires and you wanna set them higher, you wanna set them lower. Like for example, maybe the factory tires on here are supposed to be like 44, 46 PSI. 
and then you want to go off-road and you want to lower the pressure but you don't want your tpms light on just come over here and put that at like 28 psi or whatever uh, so you're able to do that within many different vehicles nowadays you're allowed to change uh, so hit continue and then it'll say it's done also let's not forget motorcycles are getting pretty fancy nowadays too and it's, it hasn't been it's been a little while but, uh, they have tire pressure monitoring systems on them as well uh, so oftentimes it's going to be just like with the tire pressure monitoring tool you'll walk in there you can id the vehicle like i know the tpms4 tpms5 you can walk in you can id a, ID a motorcycle as well so if a motorcycle has it, you can go in and walk you through the procedure and you can reset it that way as well. And then kind of new to the game, remember how we said the law originally said under 10,000 pounds. So now they have it where they need to be above 10,000 pounds. They need to have it as well. So we can walk through that. And then also 2019 and 2020, you started seeing OE trailer tire pressure monitoring systems as well. We can add a trailer to our vehicle right here, we can see how it says trailer setup. I don't know what kind of vehicle this is on, but uh, this is trailer setup there. And then we can also do the trailer tire pressure, which is going to be right there. Uh, so it just allows you to set your tires and monitor the tires in the trailer as well. So pretty much anything on the road with a tire now is going to have TPMS in it. I think you can pretty well hang your hat on. All right, so let's go live on the tool, talk about a couple of things. So I'm going to start with this Jeep here. Let's go on the scanner. So that is, since this is an 18 and newer Jeep, it means it's behind the, the uh, secure gateway. So that's just what's going on here. We're doing a security link here. All right, unlocked. There we go. And then there is all of my stuff. Right, so we got tire pressure monitor here, which is going to give us, in this case, we got codes and data. So data, we're going to be able to see, we're going to be able to see the different sensor IDs, uh, temperatures if, if applicable, uh, sensor IDs on each tire, and then uh, low pressure warnings and, and such. It'll tell us whether the hardware is defective or not also tells us you know where each sensor is sometimes it'll say okay it's left front left right rear etc so you can monitor a lot of that through here some manufacturers also provide battery uh, pids as well so we know how how the battery is doing on the tpms three four and five uh this, the tpms tools we have they also if you scan each tire pressure sensor it'll tell you the battery status as well now, on a lot of vehicles as well, we need to go into the body control module in order to do stuff like this too. So, for example, if I want to update my tire pressure, it's in the body control module on this Jeep. Procedural update the tire pressure monitoring systems, load inflation pressure stored in the body control module and the tire pressure monitor at present. Use the cold tire inflation pressure for the front and rear tires listed on the tire and loading information label located on the inside driver's door or driver's door gate. Continue. It's going to tell us what's currently in there. So these are my current pressure values front and rear and then what's set in inside the module. And then what it's going to do is it's going to say select the front placard pressure first. So let's say it's like 30. Then it's really, you can't even tell anything happens and then it flips over to the rear. So you just got to be aware of that. You might not see much happen on the screen, but you got to make sure you read it. So we did the front already. Let's set the rear at like 38. Then it's going to write it into the ECU. It's a simple programming. And it says successfully updated the pressure old values, tire pressure threshold values. And then it would show you the current values here. I'm in a demonstration mode. So of course it's not gonna show me anything necessarily realistic, right? So that is my Yeep. Next thing, let's go back to that GMC. And we'll go to my quick lookups. We'll go into that tire and wheel service again. Like I says, quick link on pretty much any current snap on scan to a current software. Yeah. It's going to give us our TPMS reminder reset. We already saw that. You can also see removal and repair. So this is going to tell you how to remove, how to install, how to repair your different tire pressure sensors. And then also it gives us tire fitment as well. So we can see four wheel drive, front wheel drive, uh, any vehicle options and uh, 
factory tire size, optional tire sizes as well, tire inflation pressures, wheel nut torque specs, wheel base, rim size, and bolt pattern. It looks like they're all six by 120 on there. And then of course, if I wanted to hook up into the scanner as well, I can go to functional reset. And functional test is right there. And I can do tire type and pressure selection, which we saw already there as well. Because um, we can change it, right? So good to know. And the last thing, this, this one had a couple little weird things in it as we went through. So I'm going to, it's a 2016 Camry. And we'll go on a tire and wheel service this way. Okay, so this has uh, the tire registration process says we need to use the, uh, the um, scan tool in order to do it with the special tool to turn it on. And then we have initializations there as well. It's gonna tell us a couple different things. Walk you through the procedure. Remove and repair, same deal. There's how it works. Tire fitment, not much change on that. And then functional reset, we're gonna go in here and there's a couple interesting things. So we have the tire ID registration and the TPMS module on this Toyota. It's used to register the tire pressure transmitter IDs. Okay, key on, engine off. It's gonna do the main set of tires. You must have each tire pressure sensor ID ready before continuing. So this is very similar to the RAM. Uh, and it says number of unregistered IDs is four. So the tire sensor ID for this vehicle is seven character identifier. If you acquired the IDs from a data display, please ignore the leading zero when entering the registration of each sensor. So if I took the data, copied it, and then I need to plug it back in, um, and it says zero as the leading number, we need to remove that uh, zero. So it just gives us over here that. So it comes up as eight digits in the, in the pin or the PID, and then you need to punch in seven digits. So I'm gonna continue. And there's the first sensor ID. We'll just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Okay. That's what you entered. Confirm. Second sensor. Right. Third sensor. And fourth sensor. So you'd have to punch those in manually. I'm not going to do that right now. Registration completed. And we're done. So in that case, you need the sensor IDs off the vehicle in order to program them. So you do need a scan tool to do that. Uh, or the, like I said, the TPMS-5 does have built-in function for that as well. All right, so that's my time for this evening. Hopefully you picked up a few tips and tricks on TPMS. As for next week, we're talking about auxiliary emissions systems operation and testing. So this will be uh, kind of a smorgasbord, a catch-all, if you will, of different systems that might not be on every manufacturer. Maybe some manufacturers have never used these systems. Things like, well, EGR valves, those are fairly commonplace, but tumble generator valves, variable runner intakes, things of that nature. Different things that maybe we might not be able to dedicate an entire half hour to. We'll put them all together into this one class. So hopefully you can join me next week for that. Same time, same place, six and nine Eastern. Join me on snapon.com slash OT if you want to join on Zoom to sign up for that. And then also the 6 p.m. Eastern class goes to YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics and check that out, if you are watching it on YouTube right now, please make sure you like and subscribe and ring the notification bell so you get notifications next time that we go live. Also, the 9 p.m. Eastern class goes live to Facebook. So if you want to give me a follow there on Facebook, it's snapon.com. Oh, sorry. It is facebook.com slash snap on Jason, all one word, no dash in the snap on. If you want to check out any of our previous live stream topics, they're available on our YouTube channel as well. So once again, that's youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics. Uh, we have 47 different episodes as of right now. Everything from ADOS through thermal imagers, hybrid vehicles, tire pressure monitoring systems like we have today is up recorded. If you want to watch it again, uh, it's all available ready for you free of charge. And with that, we're up to Q&A. Now, as I said, this is a pre-recorded session this week. So if you do have any questions, you're watching on Zoom, just reply to the confirmation email. That'll go to my email inbox. If you're watching on YouTube, just leave a comment under the video and we'll help you out when we can. And then same thing with Facebook, leave a comment under the video and I will get to those uh, as we go throughout. 
Also want to make sure I mention my buddy Al, who also does free diagnostic training. He does tool specific training. So if you want to get a little bit more knowledge as to what your tool can do, how it works, uh, Monday it's on Apollo, Wednesday it's on Zeus, and Thursday it's on Triton. So very thorough class all the way from let's make sure your Wi-Fi set up. Make sure that's all set and going because a lot of features on the tool actually need Wi-Fi nowadays. And that's uh, you know through the manufacturer even. Uh, all the way through, let's set up your free Snap on Cloud account so you can upload and share files. And then we'll go through code to completion, fast track intelligent diagnostics. How does it help me as a technician diagnose vehicles faster? Uh, and then that's about an hour long for all that. Each night, depending on what tool it is, he'll, he'll just do it on the respective tool. Wednesday and Thursday, though, uh, since those tools also have scope and meter functions, take a five minute break after that first hour. And it goes through another hour on the scope and the meter and real world examples of where he would use that and what it would look like, uh, fuel pumps, things of that nature. So same time, same place, Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday, pick your uh, tool, snapon.com slash OT. He only goes to Zoom, so you'll need to be, it's more of an in-person type session. Your camera's not on, but he will be able to answer your questions. You type them in the Q&A. He's definitely you know, able to answer your questions live, and it's kind of designed to have the tool in front of you following along with what he's doing on the screen. So once again, go check him out, snapon.com slash OT, it's free. With that, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your busy week to come join us. Hopefully you picked up a few tips and tricks on the capabilities that you have to diagnose motorcycles and hopefully maybe you know add that to your repertoire if that's something you wanna do. If not, maybe you got a little bit more information on what the capabilities are anyway. So with that, Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Have a good night.